right? So, that I just I mentioned that, we're not going to go deep into that hadith, but I mentioned that because that is the reminder that I remind myself with when we start something like this. And it's a reminder that everyone should keep in mind as well. Why am I learning? Why am I doing this? It's something that can apply to every single action and every single thing that you do, right? This hadith then comes after it, right? So they say that, some of the scholars say, so hadith of intention is like the, is like saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So it's the thing that starts, it's the thing that pushes you. Because the intention is the thing that is your motivating factor, right? And then they say that this hadith, hadith Jibreel, is like the Fatiha, right? So we start the Fatiha by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then we we do, the, we do the actual, we recite in the salah, we start Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then we recite, we recite the Fatiha, right? This hadith has that, as it's, it parallels that. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim starts us, right? we start everything with the intention, just like we start everything with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then the Fatiha, what, what is the role of the Fatiha in the Qur'an? What is the role of it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it has many roles, I would say, but I, I would like to establish um, your relationship with Allah and then basically what, what you want to do, um, like what you're asking, what you're seeking from that relationship. Okay. If that makes okay, sense. Okay, good, good. Very good. Both those things together, exactly, that's what it is. Is it's a summary of the entire Qur'an, right? There is a narration from one of the scholars, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the books, and he summarized those books in the Qur'an. All of the previous revelations can be summarized in the Qur'an, meaning all of the good that they bring, all of the harm that they protect us from. The Qur'an is like that final version of it. And then the entire Qur'an is summarized in Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha gives us a road map, an outline of the entire Qur'an, of the message of the Qur'an. And then all of that can be summarized in one verse, which is, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِنُ You alone do we worship, you alone do we seek help and seek assistance from. Right? But Surah, so surah Al-Fatiha gives us an outline of the, of the Qur'an. Right? Similarly, this hadith is, it gives us an outline of the entire day. And so, Surah Al-Fatiha, one of its names actually is Umm Al-Qur'an, the mother of the Qur'an. Yani meaning that this is the thing that the Qur'an comes under, all of it. And so this hadith, the scholars, they refer it to as Umm Al-Sunnah, the mother of the Sunnah. Why? Because it gives us what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. It gives us the entire deen in a summarized version. The summarized version. Everything from the deen in one way or another sprouts and comes from this hadith here. Right? So the, the, our goal in going through this hadith, this is not meant to be uh, the subject matter of our overall class, but what it's going to give us, it's going to give us a roadmap. It's going to show us what it is that we're going to focus on and why we're focusing on these things. Because if a person understands these things, Right? then a person really has everything that they need in terms of understanding the deen. Right? So this hadith gives us a summary of the entire deen. And that's why al Qadi Iyad, one of the famous Maliki scholars, he says that this hadith covers the religion to such an extent that all of the Islamic sciences, all of the religious sciences are found in it and branched from it. Everything. Everything comes from it, everything branches from it, and it covers everything in a, in a, in a general sense. So what we're going to do, inshallah, is we'll read the hadith. Does anyone want to read it for us in, in Arabic? Anyone like to take that, take that jump? Shake your mind. No, it's not going to be too slow. We'll be here forever. Okay, so... So I want you guys to get just to get used to hearing the Arabic too. So I'll read it in Arabic, and then we'll have someone read it in English. Is that fair? Alhamdulillah. And then in Spanish. All right, Bismillah. So this is Al Hadith Al Than. This is the second book in Imam Nawawi's uh, forty Hadith. This is also, by the way, the first Hadith that Imam Nawawi mentions in Sahih Muslim. Or sorry, not Imam Nawawi. That Imam Muslim, Allah, 
he starts his Sahih way. So we know we have Bukhari, right? The two most authentic collections of Hadith are Bukhari and Muslim, right? Now Bukhari, he starts his Hadith his, uh, book with the first Hadith, Inam al-Amal bin Niyat. Imam Muslim, which is interesting, is the second most authentic book after the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. He starts his collection with this Hadith, right? And it's the same message. And he's telling us that this hadith, just like Imam Bukhari, right, he starts with the hadith of intention, so we know everything, by the way, at the end of the day comes back to the intention, right? Meaning that all of this stuff that you learn, all the stuff that you benefit from, if the intention is incorrect, then it's not a benefit, right? And so similarly, Imam Muslim, he starts his sahih with this book to tell us what? That everything that you're going to get in the rest of this book, in the rest of these ahadith, you can trace it back to this hadith. So, uh, فوضع كفيه على فخذي وقال يا محمد أخبرني عن الإسلام فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الإسلام أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة وتصوم رمضان وتحج البيت إن استطعت إليه سبيلا قال صدقت فعجبنا له يسأله ويصدقه قال فأخبرني عن الإيمان قال أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الآخر فتؤمن في القدر خيره وشره قال صدقت قال فأخبرني عن الإحسان قال أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك قال فأخبرني عن الساعة قال ما المسؤول عنها بأعلم من السائل قال فأخبرني عن أماراتها قال أن تلد الأمة ربتها وأن ترى الكفاة العراة العالة رعاء الشاء يتطاولون في البنيان ثم انطلق فلبث مليا ثم قال يا عمر أتدري من السائل قلت الله ورسوله أعلم قال فإنه جبريل أتاكم معلمكم دينكم رواه مسلم Okay, long, right? Let's, let's read the English إن شاء الله Someone want to read it for us? While we were one day sitting with the Messenger of Allah, there, there appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes uh, and with very black hair. No traces of journey were visible on him, and none of us knew him. He sat down close by the Prophet, rested his knees against the knees of the Prophet, and placed his palms over his thighs, and said, O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, replied, Islam is that you should testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is his Messenger. وسلم, that you should perform salah, ritual prayer, pay the zakat, fast during Ramadan, and perform hajj, pilgrimage, to the house, the Kaaba, at Mecca. If you can find a way to it, or find the means for making the journey to it. He said, you have spoken the truth. We were astonished at his thus questioning him, وسلم, and then telling him that he was right, but he went on to say, inform me about Iman, faith. He, the Prophet, answered, it is that you believe in Allah and his angels, and his books, and his messengers, and in the last day, and in the fate, Qadr, both in its good and its evil aspects. He said, you have spoken the truth. Then the man said, inform me about Ihsan. He, the prophet, answered, it is that you should serve Allah as though you could see him, for though you cannot see him, yet he sees you. He said, inform me about the hour. He, the Prophet, said about that the one question knows no more than the questioner. So he said, well, inform me about its signs. 
He said, they are that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress and that you will see the barefooted ones, the naked, the destitute, the herdsmen of the sheep competing with each other and raising lofty buildings. Thereupon the man went off. I waited a while, and then he, the Prophet, said, O Umar, do you know who that questioner was? I replied, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, that was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So, I mean, let's, let's hear from you guys. What do you, has anyone heard this hadith before? Did you guys read it over it at least? Yes. No. Give me give me your thoughts. I want to hear from you. What do you what is, what is, what strikes you about uh, this hadith? What's something that stands out? The separation of Islam, Iman, Islam, the, the stages of okay. development. Very good. We're going to talk about that in depth. Very good. Um. I mean, this is pretty crazy. Like, I mean, we've we've talked about this before, but I mean, the Prophet is sitting with his like main companions. You know, and these are like these guys are like, you know, ready to go for anything. So here comes a stranger, looking fresh, you know, in the middle of the desert. Yeah. And you know, like I could have just imagined like the kind of questions that are going to your head. Not to mention how he just comes up like he knows the Prophet so like like. There you go. Like he's his boy, you know, resting his leg next to him. Right. Like just the whole atmosphere, like seems like it's like like it's a very significant, like like tense moment. You know? Very good, very good. Was that what you think? Um, the first thing that struck me was the awareness that the Lord had about um, you know, being in the fold of Islam, that was in the environment, that was in the people. Um, it strikes me that. I just want to get your like, I just wanted to get your kind of like, when you hear the hadith or you read it for the first time, or even many times after, what kind of hits you? Because all of those things are very important parts of this hadith. And what's amazing about this hadith, yeah, really. uh, About what the sister just said, I want to add on to that. The, to see the unfolding, the, the, this hadith, we see it. We see it when he says the, the, the hour, the signs of the hour. Yeah. We see it. It's a confirmation with the eyes, not something somebody told me. If yeah. nobody ever, if I never heard this hadith before, I see the signs spoken of in this, in this hadith. Very good. Very good. Very good. So that's what, what's amazing about this hadith is it gives us so many different perspectives. It gives us so many different ways not just, it's not just teaching us the deen, but it also teaches us a lot about how to learn the deen. It teaches us a lot of, about, about manners, a lot about etiquettes, about like Jose said, about being aware of the surroundings. Like what Sister Mariana said about uh, how the questioner is and how even the person who's asked, hit, there's etiquettes in there as well of saying, I don't know when they don't know, right? Of just a lot, we get not just the information here, but we get a lot of the surrounding as well, a lot of the manners, a lot of the etiquette. And that's what's amazing at the end of the hadith. What does the Prophet وسلم, he tell uh, Umar? He says, That was Jibreel, he came to teach you your, your religion, right? Not just it teach it, not just to teach you what the main foundational aspects of, of it are, but also to teach you what it means to, to, that this is your deen, right? The manners and gaining that knowledge, the etiquettes that come from it, how to respond, because at the end of the day, we're either, for example, teaching or learning, 
right? So it gives us what are the etiquettes of the person who's teaching, how does he teach? The people who are learning, how do they learn, right? The main fundamental core elements of the deen. So it's, it's a very holistic and it's a very beautiful hadith. So we'll keep coming back to things that if, things, if something strikes you or if you have a question, like I said, this is something where, inshallah, at any time, if you just uh, have something that you want to add or that you want to uh, inquire or ask about, then do that, inshallah, as well. Yes? Uh, the, 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 nobody knew him, so he wasn't from there. His clothes were, were white without sign of travel, yeah. but he wasn't from there. Yeah. So where did he come from? Exactly. Exactly. So these, we're going to talk about that now, inshallah. So... There's a little bit of a context or a background to this hadith as well, right? That some of the scholars, they mention uh, two specific contexts. One, about why the, about what was happening at that time. And then one, why this hadith was narrated. And it was narrated by Abdullah bin Umar on behalf of his father, Umar bin Khattab. There's actually a story behind that as well, just a very a brief story that we can touch upon that also has benefits and lessons in it. But the actual hadith, what was happening when the hadith, when it happened? What was happening at the time of the Prophet ﷺ? This actually happened at the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's interesting, right? Because you would think that this way, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, these are basics, right? These are fundamentals of the deen. You think, when would this come? This would come in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? But in fact, it comes at the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Some say that this was after Hajjat al even after the farewell pilgrim. Some say around this time, some say a little bit before. Point being, either way, it's at the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And there is a tremendous lesson in that for us as well. That this is coming as a summary of the mission of the Prophet ﷺ. It's coming to teach the companions also what questions are the most important for them to know the answer to. And it's teaching them how to learn. And it's also teaching them that the learning of the deen has to occur with what? It has to occur through, through give and take, through teaching and learning. Right? Because you could have the Prophet ﷺ passing out books to the companions and them reading the books, and that's it. Tell us they learned the deen, especially at the end, right? But you have Jibreel alayhi salam coming and teaching, right? Or him coming and asking, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam teaching. But even Jibreel coming and asking, is, as we'll see, is going to be a form of, of teaching. Because it's Jibreel, he obviously knows the answer. So what's the benefit of him coming to ask, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But the point is that Jibreel alayhi salam comes and he is showing the companions and actually he's showing us. Because at this point the companions of the Lord have been learning with the Prophet ﷺ, but he's showing us that this deen, the way that it's taught, is it's taught from teacher to student. And this is how the entire deen was transmitted to us as well, by the way. Right? The Prophet ﷺ was taught by Jibreel. Jibreel was given a revelation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Allah to Jibreel. And then the Prophet ﷺ would teach it to the companions. And then the companions would teach it to their students, who would teach it to their students, who would teach it to their students, until it reaches us. And that's why we have something amazing in our deen that's really unparalleled in any other way of transmission is the, the idea of Islam, of chain, right? That you can have, especially with the Qur'an and with the Hadith, right? Particularly with the Qur'an, that you can trace back your learning of that specific science, of the Qur'an, of a specific hadith, of a book of hadith, even of specific books, all the way back to the one who wrote that book. And in the case of hadith, all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. And in the case of Qur'an, all the way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. What's the name of that word? Isnad. Isnad means change. It's a change. Right? And it's amazing. I don't know if you've met anyone who has memorized the Qur'an with Isnad, with, with a chain, but they'll show you. And it's, and it's really powerful to even see. Because you see that person's name on the bottom. Like they're getting this certification. Right? And it goes to their teacher. Right? And then that teacher, it says who their teacher was. And it goes all the way back. And it gets powerful because then you get back and you start recognizing the names. You see the Sahabi. 
you say for example, and this person, this tabi learned from Ubay ibn Ka'ab who learned from, directly from the Prophet who was given this revelation by Jibreel who got it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it connects a person all the way back to the Prophet all the way to Jibreel, all the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's an amazing concept that this is how our deen was preserved, how it was given to us and how even we learn it. Right, how we learn it is we learn from our teachers, we learn from their teachers, we learn from their teachers, who learn from the companions, we learn from the Prophet. Right? And it shows us, it gives us a level of integrity in our deen as well, that we know that what we're learning is not based off of just some random person woke up and said, you know what, today I'm going to teach you what Islam is. No, we have the ability to learn Islam from the same <coughs> sources or the same way that it was taught to the companions of the Allah. And that's why books are good. They're important. Listening to things and reading things is important. But having a teacher that has not just the knowledge but then the understanding as well is of vital importance. And the scholars they say about the person who only takes knowledge from books, it's, he has they have a name. It's called Sukufi. So it means like a person of books. And they say this person can benefit but that their mistakes are almost always more than what they get right. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is that why we refer to Christians and Jews as people of the books? The people, that we refer to them as people of the book because they received a book as well. Meaning that we know that they had revelation. Even though, like we're going to talk about, that revelation was changed and corrupted over time, but they, were, they are a people that attribute themselves to a book that was originally from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they have a higher honor than those who don't, than those who don't. We are people of the book. Of course, of course. And we have the, the, not just people of the book, but people of the only book that is fully reliable. Right? That is fully reliable and that has only truth. That's ultimate truth. Okay? So that, that chain of narration is called Isnad? Isnad. No, I-S-N-A-D. Oh, what a, the, 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 like with the hadith, like the, like the, like the, and this is how the Quran was transmitted, this is how the hadith were given to us, right, and it started out, with this, this is a whole science in and of itself, to learn how this happened, to learn the process, it was started as something very organic, very natural, because once Islam started to spread, what happened, now you have people, once, in it, when Islam is in Medina only, Everyone knows, if someone comes up to you and tells you, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say this, then you can believe that person. It's someone that you know, it's your boy, it's a Sahaba, right? But now, when Islam starts to spread, and now you're entering into places where you don't know everyone, now there's people in that, kind of, in that area, or amongst the, the people who you don't know, are they Muslim, are they pretending to be? So now it becomes, you have to ve uh, verify and validate what you're getting. Right? So they would tell, someone would come and say, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say this, okay, who did you hear it from? Or I heard that the Prophet ﷺ say this, who did you hear it from? Oh, I heard from this companion who heard from the Prophet. Right? And then now we know that that's a valid chain. If someone comes and tells us today, for example, the Prophet ﷺ said this, okay, where did you get that from? Right? Where did you get it from? Now, for us, we reference books. Right? Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood. But back then, it was people. Right? So that's how it is. That's what differentiates really our deen in terms of its integrity and preservation from any other way of life. No other, no other deen has anything near the hadith, the science of hadith. Inshallah we'll talk more about this when we get into these kind of things. But one of the scholars said, actually not even a scholar, this is an, I forgot his name, I have to go back and say, he was an, an orientalist, someone who studied Islam who's not a Muslim. He says, for the sake of the life of one man, right, the Muslims, they learn the lives of half of a million people. And this is what hadith is, right? I know it's kind of a tangent, but hadith is learning not just who they are, but everything about their life to know whether they are, whether we can rely on them in their uh, transmission to us of the deen. Yeah. The, the brother said uh, uh, that some people like to if they had a business, right, and they want to push their business, uh, they will say, the, the, the Prophet of Allah said, 
eat this. Eat, this yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, like uh, eat pomegranate. Eat pomegranate. And, and so people would, would, would you know, try to uh, take advantage of that, yeah. um, of what he said, you know. So that's why the importance of uh, it's not of the, the chain. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, right. Uh, so how, how did we get to the question? <laughs> Uh, but anyways, the chain so of narration and it's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do we get there? Uh, how do we get there? Um, Where were we? Oh, because um, it was a, it was a demonstration of it was another okay. of what Jibril and, and okay, very good, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Dr. Lafayette. So it's it's showing us how the deen, how we learn. Right? We learn from those who have are reliable in their knowledge and their character and their wisdom, and that have that same understanding as the companions of the one and those who, who learn in their way, right? So this hadith, it gives us a lot of that. And one of the things that was interesting that you guys were mentioning, so now let's read, actually let's read the translation and then we can comment on those specific things. Uh, actually, sorry, we read the translation, but I'm saying uh, specifically when it comes to what you guys mentioned, how certain things stand out, right? Certain things stood out. So in the beginning of the hadith, Umar radiallahu anhu, and the, usually when you talk about a hadith, we start and we talk about the person who has narrated that hadith. Yes, right? And Umar radiallahu anhu is someone that I'm sure that all of you know who he is. Right? The companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa One of the closest people to him. Right? And I know you guys are going to take the Maghrib class next week. Inshallah. Inshallah. And that's what, right? So you'll learn obviously a lot more about him then. But... So we won't go into, into detail about who he was, but this is someone that, you know, usually, especially uh, in the beginning stages of, of learning about Islam, you come across who Umar was. Because Umar radiallahu was someone that uh, his, his, his story and his change was something that was amazing. And where he went or where he was and what he became. Right? Where he was and then through Islam, through the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the, the message of the Prophet وسلم, he became not only a companion, right? Who, the companion is just the honor of being a companion is enough. Right? It's enough. And just to see the Prophet وسلم, just to be amongst him at, at that time is not something that's even a coincidence. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, another companion, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected from the creation those who would be the companions of the Prophet. So someone who lived at that time, who was a Muslim at that time, who was amongst the Prophet with him, it's not by coincidence. It's because that these were the best of the best, and they were there to take the deen, to learn it, and then to, to spread it to us. And we owe them a lot. Because it's through them that we know about the Prophet It's through them that this deen reached us. It's through their sacrifice, right, that we're able to be able to sit here today and say la ilaha illallah and talk about the deen. Right? So just to be a companion is an honor that is unlike anything else. But then you have Umar reaching a level of being the second greatest of the companions. In fact, the Prophet said about Umar, if there was going to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. If there was going to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. But there's no Nubu'a. There's no prophethood after me. Right? So he was someone who was an amazing, an amazing person. Right? And inshallah, the, you guys can tell, tell us more after you attend the, the Al-Mahr <laughs> class. Right? But we'll, we'll limit it to that. But he's someone who's narrated this hadith and he says that we were sitting with the Prophet Wasallam one day. And this hadith, by the way, is not only narrated by him. There are other versions of the same story, the same incident, narrated by many companions. Many companions, like Abu Hurairah, the version that's in Bukhari is narrated by Abu Hurairah, which shows us what? That this incident stood out. This, there was something different about this incident. And that's what you were saying, right? That something like the way that this event is going down, it brings about a level of attention. And that's what we get, right? This, even though it's a long hadith, we find many companions narrating it and narrating it with these specific details. Showing us that this is something that stood out. Right? So he says, this is what he says. He says that, إِذْ قَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجْلٌ شَدِيدُ الْبَيَاضِ الثِّيَابِ شَدِيدُ سَوَادِ الشَّعْرِ 
لا يرى عليه أثر السفر ولا يعرفه منا أحد. He says, so we're sitting there with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and this is what they would do. They would sit with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, they would, you know, talk about their dreams, and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would sometimes sit with them and say, who had a dream, and he would, you know, interpret that dream for them. Sometimes he would teach them something that was just revealed. Sometimes something happened in their life that happened in the city of Medina that the Prophet ﷺ would comment on. So he, was, he would spend time with his companions, right? And this is amazing, right? The Prophet ﷺ, with the amount of responsibility and what he has, he not only spent time with the companions, but he had such a close and beautiful relationship with them. That you can see that there are times when, like for example, when they went on the Battle of Tabuk, the Prophet ﷺ was with a large army. One person that he knows, that was close with him, is not there. He doesn't see him, he asks about him. Out of an army of 30,000, he asks about one person. Mm -hmm. One of the companions, one time he had a, 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 he would come and sit in the gatherings of the Prophet But now we're talking, at the end of the Medina period, you're having, you're talking about a lot of people there, right? And so this companion, he would come and he would have his young son with him. And he would like play around in the gathering and stuff. He stopped showing up for a day or two, the Prophet ﷺ said, What's, what happened? What's going on? And then he went and he visited him. Because he found out that something had happened to his son. Right? A companion would get sick, would be missing for a day or two, the Prophet ﷺ would notice, would ask, would go and visit. Right? It shows that the, the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ wasn't limited to like, let's sit in class and, and talk and teach. No, it was rather, it was, a, it was actually a suhba. It was a companionship. And that's why they're called his sahaba, his companions. Because they went through it all with him. And the Prophet ﷺ cared about them more than even they cared, they cared about themselves. Right? So it's, it, that's why you find the companions of Allah love the Prophet ﷺ more than they love their own selves. Right? Literally. They loved him more than they loved their own self. They would love what he loves more than what they would love for their own self. Right? And there's so many examples of this. Just one example, right? Even something small. Anas radiallahu anhu, he says that the Prophet used to love eating squash. Right? And I, because Anas, he grew up in the household of the Prophet. He was young and stayed with him for those 10 years in Medina. And he says, I never liked it. It wasn't good. I would see the Prophet when they would bring a dish, he would look in the plate for the squash, right? And he would eat it. Dubba, it's called. And Anas, he says that I never liked squash. But then when I saw how much the Prophet ﷺ liked it, I loved it. Right? Because something that he loved, I would have to love. Right? Because that's that's how much that they had this this care and this attachment to the Prophet. ﷺ. So they're sitting with him, وسلم, and he says, and then a guy comes in. Right? He says, a, a man comes in. No one knows him. He says, and, that, and, and not just that no one knows him, but the way 